This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. SE Radio listeners, we want to hear from you. Please visit se-radio.net slash survey to share a little information about your professional interests and listening habits. It takes less than two minutes to help us continue to make SE Radio even better. The responses to the survey are completely confidential. That's se-radio.net slash survey. Thanks for your support of the show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Jeff Doolittle. I'm excited to invite L. Peter Deutsch as our guest on the show today. L. Peter Deutsch is best known as the original and primary author of Ghost Script, the inventor of the term just-in-time compilation in connection with his early JIT compiler for Smalltalk 80 and one of several independent originators of simultaneous Libre and commercial software licensing. He has also contributed through documentation as writer of the RFCs for Deflate, Zip, and GZIP, and through conference presentations on a variety of topics, including software patents and software security. Peter, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. So you mentioned in a previous conversation we had that you've been in the industry for about 60 years. And I imagine you've seen a lot in those 60 years. And there's probably not a lot of people who can claim that they've had a 60-year career in the software industry. At this point, that's probably right. It wasn't very customary for someone to start writing software at the age of 14 when I started. These days, you know, people start coding in grade school. Right. Some do. That's, yeah, it's true. In fact, my first programming class was in junior high school on a Commodore 64 back in the 80s. So yeah, definitely started, I guess around the same age as you, I suppose, but maybe a little younger. Well, what we're here to talk about today is something that a lot of people have probably heard of and how much they've thought about them and where they came from and how they are relevant is a great conversation for us to have. So I'm referring to, of course, the fallacies of distributed computing. And in the show notes, we'll put a link into the Wikipedia article on those, which, as we might explore during this show, may not be entirely accurate. And hopefully, as a result of this show, we can help correct some of the mistakes or errors that might exist in that article. But let's start with what's the background of these fallacies, Peter? How did they come about? And sort of what time frame did these fallacies come into existence? So... My contribution to the fallacies came about during a year and a half that I was working at the, what was then Sun Microsystems, which was from the latter part of 1991 to the earlier part of 1993. So at least to that extent, the dates in the Wikipedia article are incorrect. I'm not a networking guy. I've done very, very little with networking technology. But I think as part of the kind of new hire hazing process at Sun, the first thing that they had me do was co-chair a working group on mobile computing strategy. And my co-chair was a talented engineer named Carolyn Turbyfill, and I believe she had primarily a hardware background. So the two of us, you know, set out to talk to the engineers within Sun to find out what Sun was doing and, you know, get some ideas as to what Sun might do in the future. And it was in, in the course of those investigations and learning about Sun's work in networking that I came up with my contribution to the list of fallacies. When I arrived at Sun, the first four fallacies were already known and established, and I knew that they'd been originated by one of the two Lion brothers, and I didn't remember whether it was Tom or Dick. And then I added the next four, and I gave a presentation at Sun during my time there that, if I remember correctly, had all eight of them in it. So. In the course of that investigation at Sun, something became pretty clear to me, which was that at the time, Sun had a couple things going for it. But the most important one was that they understood networking you know, protocols and network architecture in a way that their competitors did not. And so, but they were developing, had developed, I guess, this kind of clunky, bulky mobile device, which today I guess we would call a laptop. And 
it seemed that they wanted some guidance on how to proceed in that arena. Well, we wrote a report and what we said, I wrote most of the report as I recall. And what the report said was, look, Sun does not have a good competitive differentiator in the hardware arena. The Japanese and Korean companies are better set up to move forward. They were already ahead of Sun at that point, if I remember right. But the thing that Sun does have as a differentiator is engineering depth in networking and network protocols. So Sun's strategic path forward in network to be successful in the mobile space is to develop and offer the non-mobile infrastructure for mobile devices. And we didn't have the terminology for it then, but in retrospect, what I was basically recommending was that Sun be a groundbreaker in what today is called cloud computing or it's server-based computing. Well, this was you know the early 1990s. And when I've been told by someone who was in a position to know that when this report got to the desk of Scott McNeely, who was the CEO of Sun at the time, that he read the report, said, who are these bozos, and tossed it in the trash. <laughs> and having been, in retrospect, right, brings me a certain amount of satisfaction. And it does, of course, make me wonder, and possibly our listeners as well, how the world might have been different if the reaction had been different at that time. And I even imagine that many of our listeners don't even know what Sun Microsystems is or was. That's right. They made some other, I think, perhaps not great strategic choices and wound up being gobbled up and then pretty much dismembered by Oracle. Right. And of course, ideas are a dime a dozen and what matters is execution. So even if the ideas had been embraced, it didn't guarantee success. But it is interesting to think about the the possibility that we could have had things differently. You know, the 90s really, from my recollection, were more of the, the client server era in many ways. But it sounds like the report was in a way leapfrogging that and saying, hey, let's get past that and let's actually embrace what, you know, what we, I think we'd now call network computing or, as you said, the cloud. So, you know, I don't remember exactly what we said, and of course, I, I didn't take away any copies of it, but I'd like to think that we were maybe a little bit ahead of the time. You know, you talk about good ideas not always coming to fruition. The one that in the networking arena that I think of right away is Xerox and XNS. Hmm. You know, IPv4 was an outgrowth of what was basically the successor to the original ARPANET design. And IPv4, is, it's a great architecture and, and it served very well, but you know it, it's run into limitations. It's run into a capacity limitation, which nobody I think ever would have foreseen. And there are differences of opinion about how good IPv6 is. I'm not qualified to weigh in on that. But the thing that I did want to you know, want to mention is that Xerox actually developed their own competitor, if you will, to IP. It was called XNS, and it greatly predated IPv6. And it was based on a very different principle from IPv4. With IPv4, one of the problems and one of the things that has, you know, made approaching the capacity of the IP address space difficult is that IP addresses combine identification with routing. If you look at the way an IPv4 address is put together, part of the address basically says, or at least started out saying something about what network that device was attached to. And if networks grow at different rates and, you know, if different geographic areas, you know, have different needs in terms of their amount of namespace, the IPv4 model just isn't cut out for it. That's a fascinating insight, right? That the topology was coupled to the routing. The, absolutely. I mean, or vice versa, vice versa. Yeah. I'm not the first, and I'm sure I'm not the thousandth person who's made the observation that this had a bad effect on, on the evolution of the network. But, but it's something that, that people have come to realize. The interesting thing about XNS is that, as I said, it far predates IPv6 and it decoupled routing from naming completely. Devices had permanent, if I recall correctly, 48-bit names, what today we know as MAC addresses. They did not 
have IP addresses in the sense of IPv4. And furthermore, those unique IDs were not necessarily arranged or partitioned in any way that had anything to do with geography. That architecture puts a much greater load on routers because they now have to keep routing information for every device. A full XNS address consisted of a 48-bit device ID and a 32-bit, again, unstructured, unique ID for a network. So the idea was that routers would expect people to be supplying these, whatever it would be, 80-bit addresses, and would start out by routing packets to the network specified by the 32-bit address, which might be wrong. It was only supposed to be a hint, a very reliable hint. But if a device moved from one network to another, you know, the 80-bit address would be wrong. The 48-bit address would be fine. And so there was machinery built into the architecture, you know, for recovering from the situation where devices moved between networks. And Xerox didn't do what they should have done, which was to make all the specs public, you know, to encourage implementation and deployment by, you know, everybody on the planet. If I remember right, they tried to hold XNS closer to their chest as a proprietary protocol. And that was a horrendous mistake. And that is not perhaps the only factor, but certainly one of the factors in XNS not gaining traction. So while this isn't directly related to the topic of the fallacies of distributed computing, it does touch on something that is related to them, which is the whole issue of the benefit to the developer of a standard that comes from making that standard open. Because the developer of the standard and the promulgator of the standard, even if they don't have full control over it, are first out of the gate. And they have probably a deeper understanding of it than anybody else. A great example of that is Adobe. You know, I mean, I did GhostScript, right? It's the second implementation of PostScript. But as one of my friends at Adobe once said, that my business was about as much concern as a competitor Adobe as a fly on an elephant's <laughs> Because, you know, Adobe had this entire team of developers and deep understanding of all the issues behind raster image processing. And I didn't. You know, I was a software guy who started out not knowing much of anything about graphics. So, you know they're still the flagship. And the fact that they made those specs open and in fact put a, a good bit of resources into publishing them and making them be really good specs created this tremendous market for PostScript and later for PDF. And a tremendous amount of that expansion accrued to Adobe. If Xerox had understood that phenomenon with respect to XNS, who knows what the networking world would have looked like today. Yeah, and that so far is a recurring theme in our conversation, which is, you know, what could have been had things been different? And I think that's a great transition. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's a great transition to the details of the fallacies now because, you know, the approach to these, say, 25 years ago may be different than what it is now and along the way, and also might have been different had things gone differently in relation to some of the conversations or strategic either lapses or what have you, you know, as it relates to these, these companies. And again, with Xerox, you know, while I'll put links in the show notes for Sun Microsystems and Xerox, for those who don't know who they are, although I think Xerox is most infamous for the people who might be familiar with Xerox Park, and the fact that they basically created the graphical user interface, which of course was commandeered, borrowed, however you might say, by others. <laughs> Yes. Well, I was there when pretty much all of that was happening, but that's a discussion for another day. It is. Well, the fallacies, this is interesting too. We don't need to go too deep into to the who's and the what's and the why's and the wherefore's. You, you kind of reviewed it a little bit as we began, but you know, the sort of the original four and then four that you added in your report. And then there's a ninth that people might see from time to time around the internet, though it doesn't show up in the Wikipedia article attributed to James Gosling who we can also put a link to James in the show notes, but I'm going to review the fallacies real quick. And then what we'll do is let's take each one at a time and let's talk about why it was relevant 25 years ago and what's changed in relation to that and either how it's been addressed or perhaps they've become less relevant in the timeframe since 
you and your colleagues at Sun first created this list. So the fallacies are the network is reliable, latency is zero, bandwidth is infinite, the network is secure, topology doesn't change, there is one administrator, transport cost is zero, the network is homogeneous, and finally, we all trust each other. So that first fallacy, the network is reliable, that even seems to have some relevance to what you were saying before about Xerox and the XNS protocol. But let's talk about the genesis of this idea at Sun and, and how it was relevant back then and, and how it's still relevant today. Well, so I don't actually know the genesis of the first four. Mm -hmm. But what I can say about reliability is if you look at reliability in the context of network systems, which, of course, I really understand best from the software side, you have reliability enhancers potentially at, at all levels of what's called the protocol stack. So, you know, down at the bottom level, you may have, you know, checksums on the packets that cause the hardware or something very close to the hardware to do retransmits. Then, you know, at the next level up, you have TCP windowing. And then it's at the level above that, at the application level, that unreliability tends not to be addressed. Hmm. Now, at the time, 25 years ago, as I recall, maybe not campus computing, but wide area computing, networking, was not as reliable as it is today. So at the time, software correction for outright you know, transmission errors may have been relevant. Today, I think it's fair to say that it is not, that we now have enough experience with error detection and error correction within, you know, the kind of the ubiquitous levels of the protocol stack, that reliability in terms of data corruption as seen at the software level is just not a factor anymore. However, what is still tremendously relevant is outages, is interruptions in service. And that is still being handled badly. So error handling on network errors, I think, to the extent that even was relevant, is not particularly relevant now. Handling timeouts, handling failures to transmit is still very important, and software generally deals with that very badly. And I'll give an example that just came up in the, you know, in the last week. So my husband uses an iPhone, and he does a lot of email on the iPhone. When he tries to send email from the iPhone... If the transmission fails, number one, he says the iPhone doesn't tell you about it. And number two, it doesn't try to retransmit. <laughs> you have to notice that the message is still in the out queue and tell it to transmit again. Hmm. So this is terrible, terrible user interface design. It's terrible architecture, and it's a result of a mistaken or I was going to say mistaken attitude, but I would say ignorance or lack of foresight about reliability. Yeah, and it violates, in a way, the principle of least surprise, which is that's not what any normal user would expect an email system to do. Well, certainly not a normal user who's used to desktop computing. <laughs> but that's also another discussion. Sure. Well, as far as network reliability goes, you've mentioned you know, before the idea of it not being addressed at the application level. And it sounds like that's basically what you're saying. At the transport level, the hardware, the, as long as we're not talking about you know, full outages, but error correction and things of this nature are, in a way, we could say solved problems. But then to say, therefore, we don't need to address it at the application level is just another reflection of this fallacy happening pretty much every day still. Right. I agree with that. The only you know kind of distinction that I wanted to make was that that dealing with errors at the application level, I think, is not really necessary. Dealing with outages or interruptions at the application level mm. is still extremely relevant. Yeah. And as kind of a little postscript to that, I should say that one of the things that annoys me the most is that when there is, you know, a failure to transmit or, you know, some kind of outage, I'll see, generally speaking, that something is not happening. But being able to get any information at all about why or where the outage is, applications, A, generally don't share that, and B, the levels of the stack underneath them 
may not be set up to provide that information. So that is an oversight on reliability in the lower levels of the stack, you know, if that is in fact the case. That makes sense. And I see attempts to try to resolve this a bit more explicitly with new protocols such as gRPC, which you know, flat out has a deadline within the payloads that you send by default. And so there's an example of making timeouts front and center. It's like you should expect this thing to be either processed by a deadline. And if not, you should be ready to handle the fact that it wasn't processed as opposed to HTTP, which is much more loose in that regard. It is. But, you know, you mentioned timeouts. So something that I've been having an ongoing wrangle with my broadband provider about we're out in the country and we have uh, wireless broadband and it is extremely annoyingly unreliable. And <laughs> even when I call up their tech support, sometimes I can't get any, any information from them about where they think the problem is. And it's not clear that they even have that information. So for example, something that I believe they don't have is I don't believe they have good hop by hop outage logs hmm. if they did they'd be able to say oh yeah you know the problem is in our connection to the backbone you know the problem is in this intermediate link between where you are and our hub the problem is between our antenna and your point of entry the problem is beyond your point of entry that's something they ought to hmm. be able to tell me they ought to have that information and they don't so it's not just a matter of problem recovery i think this particular fallacy also leads to inadequate tools for problem diagnosis and communication. Absolutely. And of course, you told me that as we're in the middle of recording a podcast from hundreds of miles of distance from each other, that your network is not reliable. So hopefully the fallacy <laughs> will not bite us as we're here recording this. Well, as it happens, I have an office that's not at my home and it has very, very reliable DSL broadband. And that's where I am right now. Oh, well, that's good to know. So, but back home in the country, I imagine yep. not only is the network as reliable, one fallacy that you clearly live and breathe on a daily basis, but <laughs> that leads very well into the second fallacy, which is people build applications and systems assuming that latency is zero. Right. So this is something that's actually come up in my own interactive work when I'm here at the office and interacting with a server back at the house. One of the failure modes of the wireless broadband is not a complete loss of connectivity, but is multiple retries that may cause things as simple as, you know, as character echoes to get delayed by many seconds. And when that happens, sometimes one isn't sure whether something actually happened or not. And, you know, you spoke about timeouts. Timeouts aren't a bad idea, but for an application to be able to tell you whether something is in the process of happening or not would be, I think, really valuable to users. Mm -hmm. And so there are really two aspects of latency, and one of them actually relates directly to the next fallacy on the list. There can be latency caused by, you know, the latency in the transport of any individual packet. But there can also be response latency that's caused by application developers having unreasonable expectations or simply not having thought about the amount of data that has to be transported for a given interaction. Hmm. So, you know, because the broadband bandwidth has been steadily increasing, this is less important than it has been in the past. But even today, the difference in responsiveness between graphics heavy web pages and more I should say, information-oriented web pages, the difference in responsiveness can be quite noticeable to the user. You know, if the user was on a, you know, 100 megabit LAN, you know, they might not see any difference at all. But mm -hmm. if, you know, if they're on the other side of a broadband connection whose, you know, whose bandwidth is only a few hundred kilobits a second, then they are going to see that. And I'm in the process of developing actually my first web application and that actually is an issue because the server for that application is on the other side of that wireless connection. And that wireless connection in one direction is typically only about 500 kilobits a second. So if you have a web page that's, you know, 20 kilobytes, 
20 kilobytes is what, 160 kilobits. So just transmitting that page takes a third of a second. Mm -hmm. And while that is an artifact of bandwidth and not of latency at the network level, it shows up as latency at the user level. And so the two are really connected. Absolutely. And when you consider that most web applications are loading more than one resource at a time, then that's going to lead to cascading effects. And, you know, you often run into those situations where a team says, you know, or people ask, why is web app slow? And you just got to open up your developer tools and you see the chattiness of all of these individual interactions and they just can compound. Indeed. In fact, a change that I actually made in my application partway through development, it used to store the common JavaScript code, the CSS, and the main page on three separate web pages, and the browser had to make three separate requests for them. And simply sending all the data in one request actually made a noticeable improvement in the responsiveness of the application. So that kind of thing. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is we may not even have to worry about that as much in the near future because HTTP2 and then the quick protocol, which I'll reference in the show notes, you know, these protocols are coming out that can actually allow multiple requests to be fulfilled along the same connection. Whereas, you know, what we've had since the beginning of the internet is more of this, you know, per resource requires its own, you know, connection and, and there's not this ability to sort of inline these requests. So well, some of that is going to be hopefully somewhat resolved, but Sounds like you're not so sure. <laughs> well, the thing is that what you just described is doable now because HTTP is a connectionless protocol. So mm -hmm. if the browser and the application of the browser are multi-threaded, the browser can issue multiple HTTP requests and have them basically you know, be a, a convoy going through the network in one direction and having the responses come back in a convoy in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that part of the reason that doesn't happen is that the rules for sequentiality versus parallelism in loading multiple components of a web page are perhaps not thought about as often or as carefully as they could be. And of course, if a page in turn has references to another page, that has to be done sequentially because you can't make the second request until the first page, until the first one has been satisfied. So what you're just describing undoubtedly will make the situation better and will make it easier to do well. But I think at this point, the issue is not so much that you couldn't queue HTTP requests, but as that it is awkward to do within the current technologies. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good thing to point out, I think. You know, a lot of it is how the browsers have implemented things has an impact. And most browsers have some kind of a limit on your connections, which is kind to the server because, you know, if a browser could have a thousand connections, then you're, you know, you're, you're going to have DDoS attacks basically just by regular usage of your, of your system. So there's, sure. there's some throttling and things of that nature that, that help. So I noticed something is what you were saying there is the interrelationship between these fallacies as well. They can't really be taken necessarily independently as you were just demonstrating here that latency is zero and bandwidth is infinite, there's some interplay between how those fallacies behave in the real world. And there are other connections on this list. So for mm -hmm. example, I mean, we're not there yet, but the connection between number four, the network is secure, and number nine, we all trust each other. There are connections between those two. Mm -hmm. And there are connections between number five, the topology doesn't change, and number six, there is one administrator. Mm. Those are also connected. So you know, we'll get there in due course. Elastic enables the world's leading organizations to put their data to work using the power of search. Whether it's connecting people and teams with content that matters, keeping applications and infrastructure online, or protecting entire digital ecosystems, Elastic's search platform is able to surface relevant results with speed and at scale. Learn how you can get started with Elastic's search platform for free at elastic.co slash se radio. Sure. And that's a great opportunity to transition to number four, which is the network is secure. And as we're diving into that, it again, it occurs to me as well that it's interesting how many of these fallacies, they seem to pertain greatly to the applications that use the network, not necessarily just to the network itself. And maybe that's something that people haven't recognized before is they're about networking networking 
But it sounds like in some ways, the fallacies are more about the expectations we have of the network and how we use the network. Because in some ways, the network, you know, the networks we have, have resolved a lot of these problems, as you pointed out before, at the transport layer. But at our peril, we ignore them at the application level. Absolutely. And in fact, for number four, which we're just about to talk about, the network is secure. There's a saying in the security community, which, you know, I'm not the security guy, but it's kind of stuck with me, which is that in a layered system, security can be lost at any level. Hmm. So the situation with network security is actually kind of interesting because the other thing to go along with what you just said about the fact that these issues are not just about the network infrastructure, but about the application as, as well, there's a third thing that they're about, which is the environment of use. In the early 1990s, networking was very new, and an awful lot of the networking that was happening was happening within technology organizations, within research centers, probably within the military, I wouldn't know. And where, for example, you know, people started out with an experience of latency being essentially zero because practically all of their networking was on campus or inter-organization networking. Mm, great point. And now, well, it's kind of interesting. We went through an era in which bandwidth was a big problem because consumers, you know, end users, non-technical users were piling into the network world faster than the telecoms or whoever could build the capacity. And now the pendulum has to some extent swung back the other way. You know, it's now pretty routine, you know, to do consumer level real time or near real time video conferencing. Mm -hmm. So bandwidth isn't infinite, but the importance of that particular fallacy, you know, went way up for a while and has now gone back down again somewhat. Whereas for number four, the network being secure, the importance of that issue has just continued to go up. Because first of all, you know, first we went from a situation where almost all the networking was done within, you know, fairly well-established trust boundaries to a situation where, you know, all of a sudden we had these, all these consumers piling onto the network. And then we're now in a situation where, number one, because of malware, the security of the end users is much more difficult and more complicated than it was 20 years ago. And I have a whole wrap on malware, which is also for another day. And also with the use of networking, including broadband networking within the government and within higher security environments, the incentive for bad players to attack networking has increased greatly. So the level of sophistication of security challenges and security threats has also risen dramatically compared with 30 years ago. Which is a great point. The more people are on the network, then the more incentive there is for bad actors to try to capitalize well, the on The more that. people there are on the network, and more specifically, the greater the value of the information being mm. transmitted and the greater the value mm -hmm of that information not being revealed, the greater the incentive. Now, you know, on the flip side, the situation has improved. It hasn't, I believe, improved commensurate to the rise in threats. But for example, you know, the fact that HTTPS and SMTP over TLS, the fact that at least hop-to-hop -hop encryption is now becoming kind of the, the norm that mm -hmm. is certainly an improvement in a big class of security situations. Sure. And that's hop to hop. Now, where would you see possibly there being other areas where maybe it hasn't been addressed? Well, so let me give you an example. If you look at email, end-to-end mm. <laughs> -end email security is a known, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a solved problem, but there are usable technologies for end-to-end -end email encryption. And there are products out there that do it. I think Signal does it. I think Telegram does it. I think there are a couple of others. But in an example of something that causes problems to, I think perhaps in all of these areas, Google will not do it because their business model depends on their being able to read people's emails. Hmm. And similarly, I think, I have no data to back this up, 
and I'm not generally a conspiracy theorist, but I wouldn't be surprised if there had been some behind the scenes discouragements, let's say, from the NSA, which had the effect of end to end encryption not being built in from the start in the email applications offered by, for example, Microsoft and Apple. Yeah, which is so interesting because, and again, and I agree with you, it doesn't really take conspiracy theories to explain a lot of things. It just takes following the incentives. And of course, there are people who'd have an incentive to do what you just described. And yet, ironically, it leaves those same entities prone to attacks themselves. So it's sort of, it's sort of a doubly bad impact. <laughs> that is true. Although you do have to distinguish a little bit between the entities being vulnerable and the entities, services or customers being vulnerable. No, that's true too. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure that, well, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if Google used more secure email storage and transport within the organization than they support for their customers. But that's pure speculation. Sure. And again, but it would be, the incentives would probably bear that out, whether it's true or not, but it, it seems like it's plausible, at least based on the incentives. Sure. So, at any rate, so that's kind of you know the, the capsule summary, which is that security is now much more on people's radar. Hop-to-hop -hop encryption is becoming used widely. Mm -hmm. A lot of the security issues now are ones that are not in the network per se. They're issues mm -hmm. of phishing and they're issues of malware penetration of the end users. Absolutely. And I also think of other things such as MTLS, which is mutual TLS and zero trust networking are becoming you know, more common. But again, even if you're dealing with these things at the network layer, that doesn't mean that the payloads that are going over that network are secure. And that's a good point you bring up there is, you know, the network is secure isn't just about the transmission. It's also about the payload within the transmission. And if we assume that that's secure because the network is secure, assuming the network actually is secure, we still have problems that are being left unaddressed there, such as email not being secure. I mean, the payload may be secure in the sense that you can have a very, very high level of confidence that it hasn't been corrupted in transit. The issue mm -hmm. of what that payload does when it arrives, that is exactly part of the larger issue of network use. And, and that has people don't, I believe, have a, a good handle around yet. Yeah. Don't spend enough time thinking about it and designing systems to deal with it. Well, we've gone through the four original fallacies from Sun that you certainly included in your report, but now we're about to move into the four that you contributed in your time at Sun. And this fifth one is near and dear to my heart as a software architect, because I think a lot of times the topology is left undiscussed or not really considered appropriately. And a lot of architectures are tightly, in a, in a similar way that we described before about you know, XNS decoupling the routing from the network. And I think this is a pretty common problem generally with the assumption that the topology doesn't change. And it's also, we based on that, we make assumptions about our application architectures that couple us to topology. So one of the things that has definitely changed tremendously in the last 30 years is the fact that so much of network usage is now based on mobile devices. So networking has had to evolve to deal with a situation where the topology, at least at the edge, is changing constantly. Mm. And, you know, new protocols have evolved for that, but they are, at least to my eye as a non-networking guy, to my eye, they seem a little jerry-rigged. So if you want to do TCP IP networking and you have a device that's moving from one network to another, you have to have protocols you know, for to change its IP address as it's moving. Hmm. And once you have that, you know, once you recognize that that's happening, then you have on top of that, the difficulty of maintaining sessions. You know, if you're talking on a cell phone on a long distance trip, long distance road trip or train trip, your cell phone is going to be handed off from one tower to another as you travel. And the protocols for dealing with that constant change in connectivity have to take that into account. And as I said before, you know, IPv4, you know, has required, you know, this extra layer on top of it that doesn't play with applications very well if the application, well, it may not play with applications or operating systems as well as a 
location independent addressing scheme would. Hmm. But so that's, I mean, that's really all that I, I would have to say about that. The genesis, by the way, of this was that while I was at Sun, I was hearing constant, you know, mutterings and gripings, both from users and to a lesser extent from network administrators that, oh, you know, so-and-so moved his office from here to there and that put him on a different network and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that problem just, you know, doesn't have to exist if you have the right addressing architecture down at the bottom level. But we don't. We don't. So that problem is going to be with us. In IPv6, you know, to be perfectly honest, I don't remember what they did about that. It'll expose my ignorance to say that I don't remember whether IPv6 uses location-independent IDs or not, or whether it still combines routing with addressing. Yeah, I'll have to plead ignorance there somewhat as well. I know because of the length of the address space, one of the intentions from my understanding was to enable more IoT, or Internet of Things type scenarios. Although, as you're describing the XNS protocol, it sounds like, once again, Xerox was ahead of their time, but the execution was left you know, yep. to be done by someone else. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. I mean, my old colleague, Butler Lamson, who, by the way, originally gave me the idea for just-in-time compilation, and I don't think has been adequately credited for it, once said, the single worst mistake that you can make in the design of a system is not to make an address space big enough. Hmm. Well, we might need to add that to the list of the hardest things in computer science, which are, <laughs> right, it's, what is it? It's naming things, cache and validation. Those are the two. And then it's off by one problems. But now there's a fourth, which is <laughs> failing to make a large enough address space. Butler published a great paper that talked about caching and cache and validation also. Oh, that's great. That's great. I will look for that and try to put that in the show notes. SE Radio listeners, we want to hear from you. Please visit se-radio.net slash survey to share a little information about your professional interests and listening habits. It takes less than two minutes to help us continue to make SE Radio even better. The responses to the survey are completely confidential. That's se-radio.net slash survey. Thanks for your support of the show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. The issue of changing topology is also coupled with the next issue of administration. You know, even at Sun, which theoretically should have had a single administrator for all the network connectivity issues in the company, they sort of couldn't mm. because, you know, people moved offices and moved devices and those things, you know, really should be handled at the localized level. There shouldn't have to be an administrator to deal with that. But that's only administration as, as it relates to topology. Now. Administration as it relates to policy, you know, which is on the Wikipedia page, is a different issue. And I think that what is one of the things that has become pretty clear in these 30 years in networking, and which I think generally has been handled well, is the realization that the potential of networking and internetworking can only be realized if there are well-established standards that people actually implement. And of course, every company, every company has business incentives to add their own bells and whistles that only work within the company, you know, and that's, you know, that will always happen. But what has made the internet as successful as it has, as it has been, is the fact that it has done as good a job as it has being standards-based. So the relationship of that with this fallacy here is to say that the best administration, at least of some things, is administration that doesn't need an administrator. Hmm. It is administration on the basis of standards. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm an extremely strong believer in good open standards. And I think I mean, I'm also a great supporter of open source software, but I believe that open standards for both software and data formats are more important than the software itself being open source. Hmm. Say that again. I believe that good open standards, both for software interfaces and for data formats, are more important than for software itself to be open source. I think that's a great insight. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think that's a great point. You mentioned interfaces and formats and maybe some clarification there, but when you mean interface, I mean, you could basically say in a sense, it's the API. I don't mean a web API, but it's, it could be, but it's what's exposed, how you interact with this thing and then the data that flows from it. And to it. Right. So my interfaces for software, I really did mean API. And, you know, for networks, of course, it's the protocols. But mm. this also applies to the data formats. Too many applications are data jails. You use them to create, you know, data of great value to you, but you are then locked to that application to be able to share the data, convert the data, extract from the data, you know, do operations on that data. I won't go into this, you know, at tremendous length, but my other career is as, is as a musician, as a composer. And the two leading commercial musical score editing programs, uh, Finale and Sibelius, mm-hmm. both deliberately not only refuse to publish the formats of their data, but at least Sibelius actually goes to some trouble to encrypt it. Hmm. So they do not want any third party to be able to read the data, read the information that you created using their application. Hmm. And I think this is, well, we're on the air, so I'll just say I think this is very unfortunate. It is unfortunate. It sounds like you know Microsoft Office before they changed it to an open standard, and then that changed a lot of things. And it didn't seem to hurt Microsoft to make this not that. And I'm not commenting on how good the standard is. I'm just saying <laughs> it didn't hurt Microsoft. But something that you should know is that there's a difference between making the form of the standard open and making the semantics of the standard open. Because mm. even with DocX format, even with the XML based format. Being able to render a Microsoft Word document accurately, when I say accurately, render it the same way as Microsoft software, requires Mm. knowing a tremendous amount about quirks and peculiarities of Microsoft's implementation. And that's why I said before that what's important is not only that the standard be open, but that the players, that the implementers recognize that it's to their greatest advantage to implement it faithfully. Well, this has all gone a little a little far afield, but sure, it has. Back to the point about administration, I think the the idea that standards are actually they are a form of administration, just like the consumer market is a form of regulation in a sense. And so, if you can get sort of inbuilt administration without an administrator, then you can have significant benefits from doing so. You can, and that leads into a whole fascinating discussion of political philosophy and. I'm I'm going to have to stop myself from going there. <laughs> yes, different podcast, different episode. But from that, let's move on to number seven. And intriguingly to me, as I look at seven, which is transport cost is zero, in some ways it relates to number three, which is bandwidth is infinite. You know, exactly. Like there's a relationship there. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember what was going through my mind when I added that one to the list. You know... I don't know that I can really add a whole lot to that because I don't honestly remember exactly what the charging model for networking was like 30 years ago. And one of the things that is quite striking is that today, the transport cost, at least as seen by users, is generally zero. For users, it is. But ironically, the relevance of this, I think, has greatly grown for software engineers because... Very often, they will design a system, and I've seen this multiple times in my career, without taking into account the transport costs. And then sometimes, depending on the nature of the data and the usage metrics and things of this nature, that suddenly you discover your transport cost is not zero, and it can bite you. (laughs) Well, so let me push on that just a little bit. Okay. If you look at a company that's offering some kind of service through the web, let's say, their primary usage-based cost is going to be server capacity. Mm -hmm. And it's my impression that for, you know, for high bandwidth network connections, T1s or OC3s or whatever they're called, I was under the impression that those are flat rate. So within a fairly broad range, the transport cost, it's not zero, but it's usage insensitive. Now, you know, as your traffic builds up, you know, then there are going to be times when you have to, you know, go to higher tiers of bandwidth. 
So my impression is that it's not exactly transport costs that you're mm. seeing, but bandwidth or capacity costs. And that's possible. Yeah. And that's fair. You know, if you're crossing clouds, for example, there's ways that you can try to reduce that by setting up, you know, mutual VPNs and things of this nature. But I think it's, and, you know, to your point, you mentioned server capacity, which, you know, compute and storage would be the primary elements of that. Right. I still think not considering the transport cost in relation to bandwidth and things is something we still need to be careful of. And I mean, I could, obviously I could be wrong about this, but even if it's not the biggest issue that we face, it seems to me in some ways, it's in some ways more of an issue now maybe than it was 30 years ago. In other words, it was prescient of you to see this then when the pricing models were different than they are now. Interesting. Well, okay. This may be a blind spot on my part because I don't really have, have much of anything to add. Perhaps mine as well. So let's move on to number eight. <laughs> right. Which, you know, somewhat has to do with topology, intriguingly. You know, five and eight, I think there's a bit of a relationship there. It has something to do with topology, but I think it has a lot more to do with the point that we were talking about earlier, which, you know, is not really exactly a fallacy on the list, which is the issue of standards. Mm. Because the adherence of a multi network or an inter network is to standards, the less of an issue homogeneity at the hardware level or at the implementation level becomes. Because the standards allow you to... Because the standards make the network not only appear homogenous, mm. but in operation be sufficiently homogenous. Right. And even if there's multiple standards, as long as they're adopted appropriately and consistently, it's still a form of homogeneity. It's just maybe more of a composed homogeneity rather than like a dictated top-down homogeneity. Perhaps one of my former colleagues, Jim Morris, who was a great source of wry sayings, once said, and I like this so much that I call it Morris's dictum, that the great thing about standards is that there are so many of them to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And that is a problem, of course. But the thing is that, yes, I mean, heterogeneity is an issue. And the thing is that I can't say I have, I have a lot of insight into what this observation translates into when you're developing, well, in my case, networking software. The thing is, you can only go so far because one of the big issues in heterogeneous environments is that the very semantic model of what it is that's being represented may be different. I don't know enough about network technology in detail to give you an example, but I have a good one from an arena that I'm more familiar with, which is musical score representations. So, for example, one musical score representation may say, okay, you know, you have multiple staffs and you have notes on each staff right? Mm -hmm. There's a different score representation that may say, okay, you have multiple staffs, but you may have more than one voice on each staff. And so now, you know, notes get linked together because they're all part of the same voice. And then that representation, it may even have the concept of a voice going from one staff to another and coming back again. You see this sometimes in, in piano music where you have what amounts to a single voice and it has to transition from one hand to the other. Mm -hmm. You can't do automatic conversion between those two formats because one of them has information in it that the other one just doesn't. And, you know, if I had time to think, I could probably come up with some examples of this in the networking world. So from what I can see, the best approach to heterogeneity in the networking world has simply been to get rid of it by a, you know, a community-based process that develops standards that everyone is willing to sign up to. Hmm. I think there is more awareness of this as an issue than there was 30 years ago, because 30 years ago, networks and, you know, networking hardware and software weren't kind of, you know, butting up against each other the way they do today. And I also think that, as I said before, I think the industry hasn't done that bad a job of actually carrying it out. And I think that makes sense. I'll give you an example. HTML5. Mm -hmm. There's some things about HTML5 I really don't like, but it is a part of networking technology, in my opinion, even though you know it isn't part of, of transport, where the industry has done a creditable job 
of moving a standard forward to include new areas of application and new opportunities. Now, I think of the power grid and the mistake that someone could make of assuming that the power network is homogeneous and failing to recognize that you know some power grids are on 50 hertz, some are on 60 hertz. And if you don't take that into account, you're going to have problems. And that's one of many examples of if you assumed the power grid is homogeneous you know, across the world, you'd have issues. And there are ways to resolve it. You know, yep. but, yeah. but that's a great example. And it does kind of tie back to what I said a moment ago, which is that if you kind of know what the space of heterogeneous alternatives is, then you know, not keeping them in mind is definitely a fallacy of development. It's when you know, when you have spheres of influence or, or spheres of deployment that come in contact with each other for the first time, and you have entities that have may have started out from quite different assumptions that now have to be able to talk to each other, that's where the problems really come up. That makes sense. There are tons of good science fiction stories about this. Absolutely. Well, and even the power grid, you know, what I just described is basically two different standards Right, not right. to completely, you know, Wild West, we're doing whatever we want. And now we're trying to interface. That would be the network is homogeneous at its worst, if you, you know, assuming you believe that fallacy. But the power grid is a good example. There's 50 hertz versus 60 hertz. There's a 110 versus 220. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and it used to be you had to check with the voltimeter to make sure that what you were getting out of the wall was what you expected for a particular <laughs> device. And we've resolved, we've resolved that problem. And in a similar way, a lot of these things have been resolved with the way the, the network, the global network works. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, these issues are all still there. And as we've seen, you know, going through them, some of them have been resolved better than others. And, you know, some of them still aren't sufficiently on people's radar. But, you know, with the additional 30 years of experience with small scale and then large scale networking, I'm temperamentally a pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I am. But with respect to the issues that we've, you know, that we've just been over here, you know, I have, you know, pretty sort of cautiously optimistic outlook. Well, you might have said that until we get to number nine. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. But number nine is not originally part of the eight fallacies. But you have mentioned to me previously that it does belong on the list. And we're not sure of the genesis, possibly James Gosling. But let's talk about number nine and perhaps right. the source of it and why you think it belongs on the list. Well, so it's really an expansion of number four. And it extends beyond the boundaries of the physical network the issue of security. And, you know, it's stated in kind of an informal way. If I were going to restate it, I would say something like the communicating parties trust each other. Or the party that you're communicating with is trustworthy. Yeah, I think, I think that would be the way I would say it. The party that you're communicating with is trustworthy. Okay. And assuming that they are, is the root of this fallacy? Is a fallacy. Because, yeah. I mean, Again, this is a much, much larger philosophical question of, you know, what's an appropriate level of trust? What are appropriate kinds of trust? What are appropriate trust guarantee mechanisms? These are, you know, age old questions of human relations. And they're also mm. age old questions of business relationships, of contract, of law. You know, they come up over and over again. In the context of networking, I alluded earlier to what I think are the two big edge security problems that I don't think we have a very good handle on yet. You know, one of them is phishing and the other one is end user malware. And I believe that there are known, deployable, proven technological approaches that would tremendously reduce the risk of end user malware I don't think those approaches are being deployed because they would have a very high commercial cost. And what we're seeing instead is bizarre and Byzantine attempts to mitigate them, for goodness sake, at the CPU level. Hmm. There's junk that's been slathered into the more recent Intel CPU designs specifically to try to do certain kinds of sandboxing and you know bad code detection at the CPU level. And I think that this is you know horrendously misguided. But, I mean, those are the two sources that I see of end-to-end -end trust issues, namely whether the other end is either deliberately and knowingly 
or inadvertently and ignorantly being malicious. Conf42 is a new series of must-watch tech conferences. It's online and free to attend with hybrid events coming next year. Conf42 conferences cover topics like cloud, SRE, chaos engineering, machine learning, and quantum computing, as well as programming languages including Python, Golang, Rust, and JavaScript. Register for free at conf42.com slash seradio. That's C-O-N-F number four number two dot com slash seradio. See you there for the ultimate answers. At the end of the day, from a networking standpoint, the solutions might be quite similar, but from a human standpoint, obviously intentionality, you know, plays a big role in all of this. And I love the point you made about, you know, so much of this has to do, it relates to so much more about things like political philosophy and human systems of communication and connection. And, Mm -hmm. you know, really at the end of the day, the network is about us. It's about people and how we communicate and how we interconnect with each other. It is. And that's been so much more true in the COVID era when so much more human interaction is being network mediated. Absolutely. And, you know, hey, the network certainly has improved in 30 years because I think for those of us who are very technologically savvy and even those who might be less so, COVID would have been quite different 30 years ago than it was in 2020. And we can attribute a lot of that to the technological expansion and improvements that we've had over the last decades. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, you know, to think about what it must have been like in the great pandemic 100 years ago, that was in the late 19 teens. The mm-hmm. telephone was a fairly new technology. Radio wasn't even widespread. Yes. Even electricity was, was not universal. Not universal. At that point. So, That's right. Absolutely. Well, Peter, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I'm so thankful that you've joined me on the show. If people want to find out more about what you're up to, where would you recommend that they go? Well, so what I'm up to these days is I'm basically not doing software technology anymore. I'm a composer. So if you want to see what I'm up to, go to www.lpd.org. Okay. LPD.org. But you did now, true confession though, you did tell me you're writing your first web application. So there's some software still going on. Oh, I do all kinds of software, but you know, I think I might've said this to you when we spoke earlier, you know how a lot of people, mostly men, you know, like to tinker with old cars and old motorcycles. It's Mm -hmm. sort of like that with me and software, you know, (laughs) it's in my, it's in my blood. I love doing this stuff. I'm just not like doing it in public. This application that I'm building, it's not a commercial application. It's something to help our household manage the plethora of tasks and projects that we seem to be engaged in. (laughs) And, you know, it might be good enough to be a commercial project someday. But as I might have said earlier, it's built on an architecture that doesn't scale up and that has other limitations. And, you know, some of them relate to these fallacies. I mean, it relies on a, on a low latency network. And I mm. know that. But the thing is, I know that. Mm-hmm. I knew that going in. And I said, okay, you know, you have to understand what problem you're trying to solve. The problem I'm trying to yes. solve is local to a household. It doesn't have to deal with some of these issues. Know your problem, know your use case, and don't forget the fallacies of distributed computing while you're at it. <laughs> Absolutely. But you don't need to boil the ocean and build a cloud architecture just to manage your household. (laughs) That's true. So thank you very much for having invited me. This has been a lot of fun. For me too as well. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. This is Jeff Doolittle for Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.